public authority has told us who are the overlords of the UFO. And why are they here right now at this time? There is no Air Force defending any portion of this planet that can truthfully deny that the following documented incidents did take place and that similar incidents are taking place almost every day somewhere in the world. In the southeastern United States, military aircraft have disappeared. And UFOs have been connected with those disappearances. Near Pascagoula, Mississippi, two shipyard workers were taken aboard a UFO and given physical examination. In 1976, in Kentucky, three women were taken aboard a UFO and terrorized while the humanoid crewman of the UFO gave them physical examination. In Wyoming, in 1975, an oil exploration foreman while elk hunting was picked up by a UFO along with the elk and was medically examined and returned to the elk hunting area by the UFO crewman. In Arizona, in 1975, while working in open country, Travis Walton was zapped away for five days and kept aboard a UFO. A few weeks previously, near Alamogordo, New Mexico, a member of the U.S. military was examined by the humanoid crewman of a UFO. Rather than reveal that fact, the U.S. military found duty for Staff Sergeant Charles L. Moody in Western Europe. Before the kidnappers of the UFO, humans seemed helpless. The largest circulation newspaper in the United States offers a million dollar reward for decisive UFO information. According to UFO contactees, this is what a UFO humanoid crewman looks like. This is the best UFO photograph in the world. The military took it years ago and kept it secret. NASA reveals its UFO policy. NASA astronauts have seen UFOs. You learn for the first time what the Air Force Academy teaches its cadet officers about the reality of the UFO. You learn UFO fact, not science fiction. In a surprise ending, you'll see the answers to this incredible worldwide UFO mystery. The origin of the alien intelligences who are the overlords of the UFO. You know, Captain, I keep thinking about a real problem, and it's bugging me. What's that? Well, remember the uh, TWA case when uh, Captain Schemmel dived under a UFO and about a dozen passengers got hurt? Well, I sure do, yeah. Ever think of what that would be like on a 747? Well, I've, I've thought about it, but I don't talk about it too much. Well, we got three or four hundred passengers and 20 stews moved around the cabin. Most of the passengers don't keep their seat belts fastened. Now, if a big UFO came on a collision course, and with a 747 cruising at over 600 miles an hour, we'd have just a couple of seconds to take an evasive action of some sort, a, a dive or a zoom. 300 people be smashed around and a lot of them hurt. Some could be even killed. You couldn't tell what would happen in that cabin. Probably panic. Well, panic at the least, but... You know, even if you got control and got down okay, the airlines couldn't hide a thing like that. But the FAA doesn't want to hear about UFOs. And they don't tell us, that's for sure. Now, if we talk about UFOs to the news media, we somehow get blacklisted and our jobs are in jeopardy. As an airlines pilot, no matter how many UFOs I see in the air, I'm not telling anybody about it. In the last half of this century, there has been one mind-boggling giant of a mystery, which has overridden the knowledge gathered by mankind through the ages. There seems to be no answer to the reason for the appearances of the unidentified flying object the UFOs. Public opinion pollster George Gallup reports that perhaps 15 million U.S. citizens, scientists, and other responsible observers have seen the so-called flying saucers, the UFOs. 
Who are the overlords of the UFO? What is their origin and their mission? On July 31st, 1952, in the Italian Alps, north of Milan, engineer Gian Pietro Mongusi took these pictures of the landing of a UFO on the rough ice of the Churchin Glacier. The UFO landing was only three minutes in duration. A humanoid in some kind of space suit with equipment on his back emerged from the UFO, walked partway around it, and then re-entered. And Mongoosey had the pictures to prove it. Verification of the origin of these photographs was made for the producers of this motion picture by a Swiss researcher and niece of psychiatrist Dr. Carl Gustav Jung, Miss Lou Zinstag. Since that time, world newspapers have made note of UFO stories in all degrees, from casual mention to news of an all-out UFO invasion. The mental health of UFO observers was questioned. From 1951, another photograph of a UFO from Riverside, California, showing the very significant bell-shaped configuration with three spheres projecting from its underside. This is the most familiar type of UFO and has been seen and photographed worldwide by UFO researchers. Who are the alien intelligences behind this type of space travel device? Are the UFOs friend or foe. In 1973, another significant UFO picture shows not only the anti-gravity device operational, but also with it is a smaller degravitated sphere under the control of the alien intelligences of the UFO. Who are the overlords of the UFO? In the Mediterranean, on a Sicilian beach, two small UFOs in the act of materialization from another dimension are observed by excited local citizens. Materialization, a concept far beyond the understanding of modern science, but used by the alien intelligences of the UFO. A PhD in biochemistry on the faculty of the University of Oregon in Eugene, took this picture of a UFO in the act of materialization from another dimension. Three times during the shutter snap interval, the UFO appeared and disappeared, and here is the evidence. The scientist, fearful of the scorn of his fellows, kept his name secret. He had no desire to investigate one of the most incredible events of the science of the coming 21st century to which he had been witness and to which he had photographic evidence. Kidnappings have occurred of military jets, people, and automobiles full of people. The military is helpless, and so are the police departments of the world. Where is the origin of the UFOs? UFO Quebec carried this sketch of a UFO humanoid crewman with a map of the star system in the vicinity of Zeta Reticuli, many light years away. This was indicated to UFO contactees Betty and Barney Hill. Is it truth or is it a cover-up story? Two UFOs over San Francisco, similar to UFO surveillance stories and photographs to come from every major city in the world. Iron Curtain scientists have stated publicly their feeling not only that UFOs are real, but that they have the same type of experiences which match those published in the Western world. We now reveal the facts of the UFO which couldn't be kept secret. The planet's most incredible unsolved mystery 
Despite the cover-up efforts of world governments, a world silence, silenced by fear, and a helpless world military, private scientific investigators all over the planet have contributed to the UFO evidence which we now reveal. The UFO, the secret that couldn't be kept, that can no longer be covered up. Mount Rainier in the state of Washington was the area where private pilot businessman Ken Arnold, flying back to his Idaho home, first saw nine disc-like flying objects on the sunny afternoon of 24 June, 1947. They were moving at 1,500 miles an hour, a speed far exceeding anything we could put into the air at the time. When he landed his airplane at Pendleton, Oregon, he reported the sighting of inverted saucers moving at incredible speed. The next day on the radio news broadcasts and in the newspapers, the story sensationalized the term flying saucers. The previous summer of 1946, a member of the U.S. military encountered a giant UFO in a near-miss aerial situation, and the Air Force kept the threat to air safety secret. This event happened on the first day of August, 1946, to the man second in charge of flight safety for the U.S. Tactical Air Command, Captain Jack E. Puckett. Captain Puckett's UFO encounter occurred about 30 miles from McDill Air Force Base near Tampa, Florida, where his twin-engine C-47 airplane nearly collided with an airborne object about twice the size of a B-29 bomber or about 300 feet long. His report further described the UFO as being cigar-shaped or cylindrical and with what appeared to be glowing portholes. Governmental agencies have not responded to anxious questions from UFO observers. The Federal Aviation Administration has no UFO policy or opinion. The U.S. Air Force says it has aborted its UFO study program. No answer has been publicly given. UFOs still continue to be sighted worldwide. At the U.S. Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs, the cadets in training will become the officers who will police our airspace for the next crucial decade. While in the air, in the most complex airborne machines that our engineering science can design, they will encounter the far more sophisticated UFO, which worldwide research has now shown can disable the most reliable electrical and electronic systems of an airplane. The course of instruction at the U.S. Air Force Academy must contain some reliable information concerning the reality of the UFO. Of all government agencies' questions, the most responsive answer to that question has come from the Department of Physics at the Air Force Academy in a letter from its former director, Colonel Anthony J. Maione, who says in part, In this text, an expanded section on UFOs and extraterrestrial life is included. The section attempts to provide a hopefully unbiased summary of UFO information and concludes, the best thing to do is to keep an open and skeptical mind and not take an extreme position on any side of the question. To further expand on the background we hope our graduates will have, we invited and had Dr. Stanton Friedman visit with us last April. During his visit, he presented two large audience lectures and two seminars, essentially in support of his subject, Flying Saucers Are Real. I hope you gather that we do make a continuing and real effort to provide our students with all views of current topics. They are expected to come to their own mature conclusions based upon the broadest foundation of knowledge and information that we can provide. Yours truly, Anthony J. Maione, Colonel, United States Air Force, Professor and Head of the Department of Physics. He tells of the text, Introductory Space Science and reveals exactly what the cadets at the Academy are being taught about UFOs today.
These are the men who will have to make crucial decisions while in the air when they encounter the incredible UFO. In the past, officers of the Air Forces of the world were given no instruction or any preparation whatsoever for this mind-chilling experience when they meet the spacecraft of the overlords of the UFO face to face. Nor have our astronauts been given proper instruction. From Introductory Space Science, Volume 2, page 466. We should not deny the possibility of alien control of UFOs on the basis of preconceived notions not established as related to the UFO. Our physics may not apply. From available information, the UFO phenomenon appears to have been global in nature for almost 50,000 years. Known witnesses have been reliable people. This leaves us with the possibility of alien-controlled UFOs by visitors to this planet from this solar system or other solar systems. The existence of at least three or possibly four different groups of aliens, possibly at different stages of development, which implies the existence of intelligent life on the planets in our solar system or a surprisingly strong interest in Earth by members of other solar systems, the Air Force Academy text admonishes its officers in training to keep an open mind on the baffling subject of unidentified flying objects. The honeymoon capital, this corner of the galaxy. Maybe the, the lecturers selected by the U.S. Air Force Academy to establish for their officers in training that flying saucers are real was Stenton Friedman. He had been appearing on the lecture circuit in various U.S. colleges as a UFO analyst with a high level of scientific training. Friedman's academic background includes a bachelor's and master's degree in nuclear physics from the University of Chicago. His employment background included much high-level work in space science in the area of fusion rocket research and nuclear-powered aircraft. He was 14 years with such aerospace contractors as TRW Systems, Westinghouse, and General Electric. He says... UFOs are the most challenging scientific problem of this or any other age. He made the following statements in public in Seattle, Washington, the home of one of the world's largest aerospace manufacturers, Boeing. The government has never really said what it's been credited as saying, that there are no flying signs. They really word their press releases very carefully. The press takes it that last step. Uh, I think every government in the world has three major problems along these lines with regard to UFOs. One, they'd like themselves to figure out how it works, because it makes a great weapons delivery system. It makes anything worth flying look pretty naive by comparison. Two, you'd want to make sure that the other guy doesn't figure out how to duplicate their behavior, because then you have a defense problem. If he's got something that flies like these things, we got a problem, because we can't handle it. And three, perhaps most important, a kind of philosophical political problem, as soon as it becomes obvious to the people on the planet, and widely accepted that flying saucers are real and from off the Earth, there's going to be a push for a view of man as earthlings, the people on this planet. Instead of I'm an American or Russian or Chinese, I'm an earthling. There is no government that wants its citizens to owe their primary allegiance to the planet as opposed to the country. Nobody wants to give up their power. And you know, all these jokes about take me to your leader, that's wishful thinking. What's funny about those is that there is no leader to be taken to. There's nobody who speaks for planet Earth. So there are enormous political problems with anybody saying, yes, there's somebody out there and he's coming here and he doesn't want to talk to me as a representative of the planet. Who do we, how do we choose who speaks for the planet? I don't know. Since the 1950s, it has been easy to point to the millions of suns in space and speculate that somewhere out there is the home of the UFO that UFOs are spacecraft from some other Earth, orbiting some other sun, just like ours. From a visible sun in the visible universe. Perhaps so, perhaps not. 
But the UFOs could also be from an invisible dimension in the invisible portion of the universe, which our science cannot easily detect. Perhaps one or possibly both of these concepts will one day be the explanation of the origin of the UFO. The Air Force Academy text on space science concedes that two, three, or even four levels of alien intelligences might be involved. NASA at the Johnson Space Flight Center near Houston, Texas, only concerns itself with the visible universe, with aerospace contracts administering the manufacturing of visible metal vehicles, making visibly televised trips in the Earth-Moon area, and with probes within the solar system by unmanned devices. NASA astronauts in their Skylab make a track across the nighttime sky, lit by millions of suns. The activities of the astronauts are minutely planned and carried out, but the framework is that of Earth science as we understand and engineer its applications. There seems little room for productive scientific speculation, perhaps because of the $38 billion NASA space budget, which is highly criticized in many quarters. It is difficult to explain why the planners of NASA's space program would refuse to admit the spacecraft capabilities of the alien intelligences who built this device, first seen over the Korean battle area in 1952 and photographed by the U.S. military. This picture was available to NASA. Obviously, it is not a picture of anything manufactured by humans on this Earth. It was classified then and now as an unidentified flying object, a UFO. Can we now identify it? Is this actual photographic evidence that proves that alien intelligences use a spacecraft like this to travel from their dimension to our reality? Is a Watergate-type scientific cover-up involved? Let's now examine that possibility. NASA first had warnings of UFOs from the pilots of its own X-15 project. The X-15 is a rocket-powered airplane which is launched high over the desert test area in California. The B-29 bomber is the launch vehicle which takes off, flies to its highest possible altitude, and then launches the little rocket-powered airplane. The test pilot gives it power, and the airplane goes through its maneuvers. Various complex engineering problems are worked out by such testing. And the engineering flight test pilot is one busy man. But on May 30th, 1962, test pilot Joe Walton photographed five disc-like objects from the X-15 rocket test airplane. The UFOs were very similar to the disc-like objects seen over Mount Rainier 15 years earlier by Ken Arnold. NASA made no public mention of what the disks were, their origin, or any scientific speculation whatsoever about this observance of their X-15 project by intelligences of the UFO. On July 17th of that same year, this time at an altitude of about 58 miles, test pilot Bob White noted that he had UFO company and photographed unexplained objects even closer to his X-15. Across the nation, news headlines state that 26 astronauts have seen and photographed UFOs. The public is puzzled by NASA's silence on the subject. 
The producers of this motion picture were answered on two occasions by high public affairs administrators of NASA, who stated, It's not in our charter to investigate the UFO. Inside the Skylab in zero gravity, the astronauts go through the day and night with their every minute carefully scheduled. The scientific experiments are in almost every instance planned, not to open new areas of the unknown in cosmic science, but to reinforce the ideas we already hold regarding the reality of the universe. Planners have left no time or leeway in which the UFO can be postulated, thought about, or examined. Certainly, few startling public announcements have been made of any new discoveries during space missions. No new theories have been advanced. Astronaut Jack Lausma in Skylab 3 saw a glowing red object making its way across the field of his vision. He photographed it from his little planetoid in space, the NASA Skylab. It could have been explained as a meteor glowing red in space, except that there is no atmosphere in space whose friction could heat a meteor to a red glow. Was it a UFO observing Skylab? NASA remains silent. Complex instrument packages such as Explorer 10 vanish in space. Launched on the 25th of March, 1961, it disappeared, although its life expectancy was over 100 years. Perhaps some alien intelligence is examining this complex NASA space device. NORAD cannot find it, and it is not transmitting. It just disappeared. What is the photographic evidence that UFOs are watching our every space move? Why is it so hard for the project managers of NASA to accept the reality of the UFO? Is there a high-level scientific cover-up? And if so, why? Governments are charged with upholding the law, and no law on Earth is more basic than the law of gravity. No wonder the obvious anti-gravity capability of the UFO makes governments uncomfortable. Bravely, some astronauts have stated that they believe in the reality of the UFO and the capability of the UFO to defy gravity while our giant rockets consume enormous amounts of fuel, putting a simple space capsule or Skylab in orbit. In the dark blue of space, in silence orbiting the Earth, the Skylab is the planetoid home of its crew. The crew is like the NASA test pilots in the X-15, busily occupied and concerned with the scientific work outlined for them by their NASA master. Life support in Earth orbit is a scientific victory in itself and a major achievement for Earthling. But outside alien intelligences are again observing the progress of man from Earth. Two UFOs are photographed by an astronaut during a spacewalk. The hatch is open. The astronaut is working his problem. Again, two UFOs flit by. Just moving lights, something that could be easily ignored unless we obtained other pictures and other explanations. Actual pictures which could identify the UFO as a solid object with a mission and under intelligent control. One of the most remarkable instances of UFO photography took place in 1968, here above the Boeing Space Laboratory, south of Renton, Washington. Several photographs were taken of a UFO by then 14-year-old Scott Silty. It showed its anti-gravity capabilities as it hovered over the center in two locations. His efforts produced probably the only detailed shots of a UFO materializing to show configuration and portholes. His junior high school instructor, Jim Holm, was given the negatives to develop. Holm said he didn't know what to expect, but became a believer when he saw what the young Silty had apparently captured on film. When they came in that morning and they said, uh, hey, we got the pictures we were talking about, 
uh, naturally, you know, junior high students, you're a little bit reluctant to believe everything they say. But then, uh, you know, as things proceeded, uh, what happened was I developed the pictures and uh, we know the results now. What is your impression of what that object is? Uh, I'm always hesitant, but uh, uh, I would have to say that believing the students and the type of students they were, uh, it almost definitely had to be some type of a flying object. Right out there. Right. And uh, it's a little eerie. The, the thing that shook me up at first is I was reluctant to believe them. And uh, when I printed the, or developed the film, I really couldn't see that much. But I was shocked, I have to admit, I was shocked when I put it in the enlarger. And through the enlarger, I could see a great deal more of what the object looked like. Like the porthole. Right. That was, I would say, the portholes was the most shocking part because then it really, it looked different than just a glow in the sky in a certain form, like you always hear the thing, you know, swamp gas and that sort of thing. But no swamp gas is going to have portholes or a configuration a geometric the way that was. One man who has spent the last 25 years researching and keeping track of UFO sightings in the United States is Seattle fireman Robert Gribble. He has spent his spare time gathering all data possible that will help him keep track of when and where they take place. The pins on this map indicate sightings in the U.S. for just one year. Over the past quarter century, he has come to some conclusions based on the number of sightings he has recorded. We have received and recorded some 30,000 sightings since 1955. Have you noticed any particular patterns that develop in uh, pinpointing UFO sightings on these maps? No, we have found no marked pattern, although we do believe that they are following two procedures. One, a surveillance of the land areas, a very close surveillance, and a close surveillance of the people, and it seems to fluctuate from one to the other. Now, through all these years of research, you must have drawn some conclusions about what they are what the UFOs are? Well, we firmly believe that uh, what the people are seeing in those objects which we have classified as unknown are actually vehicles uh, not manufactured on this planet. How can you draw that conclusion? How do you know? Well, the vehicles have been seen in the United States, and there are good records of this uh, for the last 200 years, and actually the records go back into history for some 3,000 years. The same thing that we're seeing then are being seen today. We understand that there are several hot spots in the United States, the UFO sighting areas, and one of them happens to be in the southwestern United States in Utah. There have been uh, a tremendous amount of uh, sightings in the uh, southwest over the years, with a uh, very large concentration in the uh, Utah area. UFO Report was one of the initial UFO publications to headline the story of the possibility that much of the early Mormon history tells of a contact with an alien intelligence, the angel Maroni. It opens the possibility that the founder of Mormonism, their prophet Joseph Smith, may have been one of the greatest of UFO contactees. Dr. Frank D. Salisbury on the faculty of the State University of Utah in Logan, and himself a Mormon, does not doubt that possibility. He has stated publicly that he believes that his UFO study has established the probability that the Earth is being visited by UFOs that seem to be using the isolated area of eastern Utah as an Earth base. In March of 1975, a national tabloid newspaper circulated the following story of a UFO kidnapping. The producers of this motion picture interviewed Carl Higdon, who furnished the artist's conception of the android crewman from the UFO who kidnapped him and took him aboard the UFO to elsewhere. Higdon was given a physical examination in a tower by a huge TV-like eye, rejected, and was returned to the elk hunting area in Wyoming where he was picked up. While on his eight-hour UFO trip, he encountered a teenage boy, 
two young girls, and a man in his 60s, also guests of the UFO intelligences. Upon his return, he suffered radiation symptoms with itching skin and burning eyes. Area Sheriff Ogburn and his deputy, Ed Tierney, investigated the incident. So did Dr. Leo Sprinkle of the University of Wyoming, who gives us this professional opinion as to the truth of this verified UFO kidnapping. To whom it may concern, my impression of Carl Higdon is that he's a man of integrity with average education, but a keen sense of curiosity about the world around him. He's an outdoors man and seems to have developed good skills of estimating size and distance. Although the sighting of a single UFO witness often is difficult to evaluate, the indirect evidence supports the tentative conclusion that Carl Higdon is reporting sincerely the events that he experienced. Hopefully, further statements from other persons can be obtained to support the basic statement. Respectfully submitted by R. Leo Sprinkle, Ph.D., the University of Wyoming in Laramie. reached a high level in the November, December, and January period of 1975 and 76, with police departments reporting large cigar-shaped UFOs and other UFO types of spacecraft hovering for days at a time over cities in this area. Five witnesses working in the open country around Snowflake and Holbrook in northeast Arizona had the most incredible personal UFO experience story to tell and passed lie detector tests in their telling of it before police and psychiatrist witnesses. 22-year-old Travis Walton suddenly disappeared one morning as the group was working in the open country. Dwayne Smith, Kenneth Peterson, Alan Dallas, Mike Rogers, and John Golette were involved in the significant UFO kidnapping incident in which a greenish-blue light originating from a UFO overhead zapped Travis Walton into an invisible dimension from which he returned five days later. His brother tells of the incident. He spent five days on a UFO, uh, he thinks. Now, there is some small time loss in there. But uh, for all intent and purposes, he spent five days on there. He did come in contact with some beings that are human-like, but they weren't human. And uh, he had quite an experience. He said he doesn't remember anything about a blue light in the first encounter last Wednesday, the blue light that they saw, he said, uh, at that instant, he got felt like he got hit in the forehead with a baseball bat, and it knocked him out. And he woke up. He was aboard one of the craft. And uh, they never spoke to him. They led him around by the hand. They wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to him. They showed him this and that. And uh, when they let him off, he woke up. Did he say they were friendly creatures? Smiled all the time, friendly never harmed him they don't he, they were just as nice as they could be but there was a total lack of communication either verbal or mental and he said that's what made him so upset that he couldn't uh, speak with him yeah, that's what he was very very disgusted about that nervous and uh, just plain disgust the chance of a lifetime and they wouldn't cooperate obviously Dwayne, you know you're brother probably better than anybody else. Uh, do you believe the story? I've never seen him play a practical joke in his adult life. A psychiatrist tells of his examination of Travis. Our conclusion, which is absolute, uh, is that uh, this young man is not lying. Uh, there's no collusion involved, no, no attempt at hoax or collusion with the family or anyone else. Uh, there's a rumor around that there's contracts, there are no such contracts, uh, no motivation for a lie. Any possibility of lying or hoax as you see it? None whatsoever. As we have indicated, UFOs can create a tremendous spatial energy flow. One of the most startling examples of that occurred several years ago on Vashon Island, which is located in the Pacific Northwest in Puget Sound, not far from Seattle, Washington. It was near the tiny town of Vashon that several UFO sightings had taken place in the late 1960s. So the fact that local residents had seen such phenomena was not startling. But the fact surrounding one of the incidents was unusual to say the least. So it was out, out in that area? Yeah. 
On the night of the 19th of February, 1968, Detective Lieutenant Terry Allman was dispatched to an old gravel pit area west of town. Some young people had seen a UFO, and the King County Sheriff's Office was sent to investigate. The temperature was 50 degrees. Allman tells of what he saw. Well, there was a lot of ice. It really had no reason to actually be there. It wasn't that cold. Out. And uh, did it have a certain consistency or something unusual about it? Well, it was an inch and a half thick and was rather milky and bubbled. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the impression that uh, you had, or why did you have the impression that it was some strange phenomenon that created this? Well, I can't be sure about that, except it was entirely too warm out to, to have ice like that. Uh, one of the other officers had responded to a UFO call at that same location the night before. The UFO energy flow had apparently left a solid sheet of ice as it supercooled the area below the UFO as it took off. At the freezing temperature of 32 degrees, it would take some 113 hours to freeze the pond 50 feet in diameter with a sheet of ice two inches thick, and the weather had not been that cold. The UFO did it. Because of official concealment, Niles, and just plain ordinary bureaucratic cover-up during the 1950s and 60s, many cases of UFOs establishing themselves as a menace to commercial airlines' safety of flight had been concealed. One night, 10 of 85 passengers aboard an American Airlines commercial flight were injured when their pilot, Captain Ed Bachner, took evasive action to avoid a UFO encounter. It happened to flight number 966 on the night of 17 July 1957 on a flight from El Paso to Dallas, just 50 miles east of El Paso over Salt Flats, Texas. The UFO continued along the Gulf Coast to Gulfport, Mississippi, where it turned north. Traffic control radar tracked the UFO and the military was alerted. In the vicinity of Meridian, Mississippi, the Wing Intelligence RB-47 electronic surveillance airplane tuned in the UFO's emission on its ALA-5 pulse analyzer. As it moved west toward Dallas, Texas, the pulse train of the UFO was analyzed as having a 3,000 megacycle envelope, a duration of two millionths of a second, and a repetition rate of 600 times a second. This was identifiable electromagnetic emission from a UFO, which was also being tracked by military and Federal Aviation Agency radar. The UFO circled Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and headed north to Oklahoma City, and continued its track north, followed by the Wing Intelligence electronic surveillance aircraft. This was continued until the U.S. Air Force plane was to run low on fuel near Forbes Air Force Base. At 1.45 on the morning of April 3rd, 1975, some 20 or more law enforcement officers in five North Carolina counties pursued a bright, glowing, unidentified alien spacecraft. Newspaper headlines told of a major incident which was, in effect, kept secret from the rest of the nation. Newspapers, radio, and television all over the world remained silent on the stories because wire service editors did nothing to emphasize their significance. From police descriptions, the artist has been able to draw the lighted V-shaped UFO which appeared. No responsible agency gave to the public any scientifically supported explanation of the origin or mission of the alien space travel device. The story was much the same two and a half years earlier in Pascagoula, Mississippi. The Pascagoula Press first headlined the story October 12, 1973. 
and told the nation about two shipyard workers, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson, who had their fishing trip interrupted by a glowing, blue-lighted UFO which landed near them. Two humanoids took them aboard for a physical examination, placing them under a large TV-like eye. Scientists were quoted as saying that the UFO report was true. NASA was supposed to probe, but didn't. Federal agencies were asked to investigate, but didn't. Hickson said the creatures from the UFO seemed friendly, but that they acted controlled, as if they had a specific thing to do, and did it. They were about five feet high, pale and ghost-like, with crab-like hands and rounded feet. As Hickson and Parker were taken aboard, they suddenly began to float on air, became weightless, and totally helpless. In the Gulf South, from Louisiana to Florida, hundreds of reports to police and sightings by police officers told of UFO activity that same night. No government agency concerned itself with this UFO kidnapping publicly. Luckily, Hickson and Parker were returned. But what of the kidnapped victims of the UFO intelligences who are not returned? Are the UFOs friend or foe? Or are they conducting a project? in which humans become nothing more than guinea pigs. This is serious speculation. Kidnapped victims seem to end up on a missing persons list, and no agency on Earth can locate them. The alien intelligences of the UFO are from somewhere, either in our dimension or from another dimension is difficult for anyone to detect. Misunderstanding the complete dominance of man by the UFO intelligences led the city fathers of Ocean Springs on the Gulf Coast to seriously decide to solve the problem by passing a law prohibiting the landing of UFOs in that area. Alderman William F. Dale, Jr. thought the local police should be able to handle it. It almost became a law. But the mayor of Ocean Springs, Tom Stennis, broke the tie vote. He said, let's make them welcome. As yet, no world governmental agency has demonstrated the power either to make UFOs welcome or to combat their landings and possible kidnapping. It's obvious that humans are helpless. <laughs> Since 1966, the very competent scientific analysts of the British publication The Flying Saucer Review have been assembling all available information about alien intelligences who have made repeated UFO landings in the high Pyrenees mountains between France and Spain. So have the defense authorities of both nations. The UMO intelligences claim they come from what we know as Star System Wolf 424, some 14.6 light years from Earth, 90 trillion miles. Near their home planet, their UFO space travel device enters a black hole in space. A giant energy whirlpool vortex which hurls their spacecraft into another dimension in which time hardly exists. From this, they emerge into our dimension, into our solar system, and proceed to their expeditionary target, Earth.
later, the UMOs were to tell the European investigators that the universe was at least a 10-dimension unity. Perhaps even more, they were not certain. But they knew of and used at least 10 dimensions of reality. Each reality was separate from each of the others. Each of the 10 realities had its own rules of energy manipulation. Even though there were 10 dimensions which were open to space travel, reckless energy misuse in one dimension can disturb the cosmic unity of another dimension and its inhabitants. Telepathy is used to receive knowledge during space travel. The mind, said the UMOs in the quiet areas of space, is especially open to pure cosmic knowledge received by telepathy. Any mentality can receive and benefit from knowledge received by telepathy. The more telepathic ability is exercised, the more valuable it becomes, the UMOs learned, as they learned many of the high scientific secrets of the solar systems they traveled through in their space exploration projects. Target Earth was to be another of their cosmic projects. The UMOs first learned of the planet Earth with inhabitants of some intelligence in the Earth year 1950. They landed and left eight of their males and females in the area which had high mountains between France and Spain. Since that time, they have studied the new planet and the method of mental understanding used by its inhabitants. They found Earth science could not account for cosmic beings like themselves. They have carefully made themselves known to certain people of France and Spain, about 30 in all. They have tried to understand the limitations which exist in the mind of man. They find human knowledge inadequate and much inferior to the cosmic understanding, which permits space voyages between the humo position in the universe and the Earth. Jupiter looks to the Earth-developed eye like this, to the UMO, perhaps different. Jupiter's moon, Ganymede, is some 8,000 miles away and moves in its orbit, its diameter 3,000 miles. The UMO intelligences took a heat measurement of the Jupiter hotspot. They compared the measurements to that of the surface of their sun and found it about the same. The other Jupiter moons were identified, Europa, Amalfia, Callisto as they were named by Earth astronomers. The spacecraft continued to the next solar system checkpoint, also at the same time slowing its rate of travel. Saturn was identified with its strange moon, Titan. Titan rolled along the equatorial plane of Saturn like a wheel on a road. The UMOs identified its atmosphere, methane. In the vicinity of Saturn, they tuned to the history and the totality of knowledge of the solar system accumulated since the time the sun was born. Knowledge lost and knowledge still used and knowledge to be rediscovered. It was from this Saturn knowledge store that the UMO intelligences learned of humankind's achievements and failures. They learned, too, of the state of development of the plant and animal life and all details of Earth and the other planets. They continued their journey past Saturn, its bright rings shining a dark space blue in the Titan sky. cosmic voyage continued to Mars. A close look at Mars revealed snow at the base of its mountains of Mitchell. On Mars, with its thin atmosphere and low water vapor content, the snow behaves differently than on mountain peaks on Earth.
leaving Mars, they passed scarcely 100 miles from Phobos, one of its two moons. 4,000 miles above the red storm-swept planet, Phobos is a dark clump, only 16 miles in length. 